is a time to worship. Come, now is a time to give your heart. Come, and just as you are. as you are before your God. Uh. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those see everyone here. We've got lots of announcements today. We've got a potluck lunch after the service today. Everyone's welcome. It's going to be soup and desserts. We should have lots. So even if you didn't bring anything, please come downstairs and join us. It's the first one we've had in, I don't know, two years. So it should be good. And uh, there's a ladies' study uh, every Thursday, 10 a.m. at the church. There's a men's breakfast every Saturday, 7.30 to 9 at the church in the basement. And there's youth started up this past week, ages, uh, grades 8 to 12. And that's every Friday from 6 till 8. And uh, we've confirmed our date for family camp. So family camp's going to be June 17th to 19th, so Friday night to uh, Sunday. And we'll have more information to come. So we're excited about that. It's been a couple years for that as well. And Children's Church... Uh, today downstairs for, for ages three to seven. Are there any other announcements? Anything I'm missing? No? Okay. Scripture reading today is Psalm 113, 1 to 3. Psalm 113, 1 to 3. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us, a day that we can come together and worship. We're so thankful, Lord, to be able to come face to face and lift your name up high. Lord, we, we praise you. We praise you because you are God. You are the king above all kings. You are the creator of everything. And Lord, you loved us first. You loved us so much that you sent your son to die for our sins. And as Easter is approaching, we, we think about that, the sacrifice that your son made. 
We've got communion later on today too, and we think about that sacrifice that uh, changed the world, the resurrection of your son that, uh, that changed everything, the forgiveness of sins. And so we praise you, Lord, for all that you have done. And Lord, help us to show your love to those around us, in our families, in our workplace, and in our community. Let your love shine through us, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for Pastor Jared. We thank you for his sound teaching on your word. And please give him the words that you want us to hear today. And prepare our hearts to hear those words, to understand those words, and to put them into action in our lives. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we ask that you would be with us. Amen.
Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name.
God is greater, my God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you Uh, children three to seven can head downstairs, if you please, for Children's Church. Before we get started with a message, I wanted to say something this morning. Today I am encouraged. I'm encouraged because I look and see a bunch of people here and smiling faces and I see new people serving every week for the past few weeks, uh, people getting involved and plugging in and using their gifts to serve this church. And that is such a huge encouragement to me. So thank you. Thank you for the two guys <laughs> serving new this morning, for the people that continue to serve upstairs, for music, for all the things happening, for the ladies that are downstairs uh, it's just amazing to see people using what God has given them, and I encourage uh, each one of us to pursue ways that we can do the same. Today's message is uh, heavy on my heart. It's been weighing on me this week. This morning, we're going to be taking a look at communion. You might also hear it called the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, which essentially just means Thanksgiving. Depending on your background and your experience, the idea of communion could be confusing, painful, weird, or even commonplace and boring. 
And there's so much that could be said about the Lord's Supper. More than we would ever have time for today. And without the counsel of my wife, you would all be listening to a litany of technical terms and theological arguments this morning. So you can thank her for getting me to throw away the rough draft of my sermon that, quote, sounded like an essay. Though there's a lot to say regarding communion, my aim this morning is to take a look at what it is, why we do it, the beauty and the necessity of it, and also the great danger associated with it. My hope is that we can put aside what we think we know about communion and we can take a fresh look at it together today. So please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll be reading verses 23 to 32. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 to 32. If you don't have a Bible, there's some Bibles in the pews. If you don't own a Bible, you can take a Bible from the pew and call it yours. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine themselves then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, We would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you have made. Thank you for a day of of new beginnings and ways. Lord, thank you that we can gather here together that we can sing praise to you, we can worship you, we can reflect upon our lives and our need for you. And Lord, at this time, as we look to your word and we see what Paul said to the church in Corinth and we wonder about this practice that you've given us, this Lord's Supper, God, I pray that you would reveal truth to us, that you would speak into our hearts, that we would be a changed people, and Lord, that we would Truly submit ourselves to you and your word. Remove any hindrance that exists in me. And Lord, speak your words to your people this day, I pray. Amen. In verses 23 to 26, Paul echoes the words of Jesus that can be found in the Gospels. From when Jesus institutes communion. These are the words that you hear a pastor speak when a church takes communion together. And Jesus said that the practice of communion is one where we eat bread and drink wine in remembrance of his body being broken for us and his blood being shed for us. Now, I'm sorry, I am going to use a big word just this time. This is not the idea of transubstantiation. We're not saying that when we take the bread and the wine that they literally become the actual physical body and blood of Jesus. We understand that this is a sign. Just like baptism, this is a physical and outward expression of a spiritual reality. And there, of course, are debates over whether all sorts of things Uh, regarding communion, but whether it should be called an ordinance or a sacrament, if you should use wine or juice, bread or wafers, partake once per year or every week, and what age someone can partake. And these debates exist for a reason, and they can be 
important issues, but they aren't our focus for today. All of these issues and terminology can be confusing and they can cause us to get lost in debates instead of focusing on Jesus and the beauty of this practice that he gave to his bride, the church. Remember, communion relates to the gospel. It's all about how Jesus came to earth to die so that we could be saved. The bread and the wine are just tangible, visible reminders of Christ's love. Don't lose sight of that. Why is communion important? Well, we're reminded of Christ and his sacrifice. This is an act of remembrance. And what an important need it fulfills. So quickly, we forget. So easily, we turn away from the truth of God's word. So easily, we get distracted, we get busy, we get hurt, and we forget the things of God. We forget his faithfulness and all that he's done for us. And the Lord's Supper is an amazing opportunity for us to refocus, an opportunity to place our attention the one place it belongs, on Christ. And during this time, we don't just remember the works of Christ, but we reflect on our own need for him. We remember our sin and how it was our sins that placed him there upon the cross. We reflect upon the sins that we still commit each day and how we grieve him and go against him. This is a time of confession and repentance as we remember. And we also proclaim the work of Christ when we take communion. We proclaim how all our sins have been paid for on that cross. We proclaim that we have a Savior who broke his body and shed his blood so that we could be redeemed. Not only do we remember what Jesus has done, but we proclaim it to both the physical and spiritual realms. We proclaim to visitors who may be sitting in church confused and uncomfortable. We proclaim to the watching world that thinks we're crazy. We proclaim. In this communion, we are proclaiming the death of Christ. But of course, we are claiming that we remember what that death purchased. We remember that the body and blood of Jesus broken and shed is the only reason that we have any hope. The only reason that we can be saved from condemnation, spiritual death, and eternity in hell. The only reason that Jesus can say to us, I will come back for you and will take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. As well, we believe that communion is important because God has instituted it for us. He has given us this ordinance, this sacrament for our benefit that we could remember and proclaim and that we could worship him in this way while we join in fellowship together. And though we call this the Lord's Supper, I love calling it communion because it truly is a time of communion with God and with each other. This is a way in which we enter into experiencing the work of Christ and engaging in deeper fellowship with Him as well as a deeper fellowship with one another gathered together. And as we remember, repent, obey, and fellowship, we worship. John Piper said, The essence of worship is the inner experience of treasuring the true beauty and worth of God. And the outward forms of worship are the acts that show how much we treasure the beauty and worth of God. Therefore, God created all of life as worship because he has told us, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do everything you do in a way that expresses your treasuring of God. And now in the gathered or corporate life of the church, One of the external acts of treasuring Christ 
that we do is the Lord's Supper. Communion is important because it's a significant way in which we treasure Christ and proclaim his sacrificial work. And what an amazing opportunity for us and what a precious gift from our God. But with all this beauty and celebration, there are some cautions and concerns as well. Things that I'd rather not talk about but things that I am compelled to examine because I am concerned for each one of us. So let's look back at our text in 1 Corinthians 11 and see what Paul has to say in verses 27 to 32. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine themselves then And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Paul says something serious to the church in Corinth. Paul actually says that people are sick and weak and that people have died because of how they take the Lord's Supper. Clearly, communion is important to God and something far more than just some crackers and juice served at a church. Think about it with me for a moment. In the early church, in the New Testament, we we don't really see occurrences of curses or death for actions in in a widespread way. I mean, one account that comes to my mind is when Ananias and Sapphira lied about giving money to the church. God struck them dead. They were accused of lying to the Holy Spirit. But here in our text, we're seeing something unique from the New Testament. The way that people take Communion was resulting in sickness, weakness, and death. Now there's two ordinances in the church today, communion and baptism. And interestingly enough, we don't see sickness or death coming upon false baptisms or baptisms being done the wrong way. Paul says that when we take communion in an unworthy manner, we eat and drink judgment upon ourselves. We're directly incurring the judgment of God. And we understand from looking at the justice and judgment of God that one day He will render final judgment. And so we need to be aware that we will be judged for our practices regarding the Lord's Supper. But we also see that God brings judgment to some right away. Some are weak, some are sick, and some have died. It's hard for me to read this passage without wondering how many people do I know that are weak or sick because of taking communion in an unworthy manner? How many people do I know that have died because of such a thing? Do I know any? It's an interesting thought particularly as a pastor. And it's hard to keep my mind from running to those questions, how many in my church are weak or sick because of taking communion? But I can never really know. And I'll be honest, there are moments, particularly this week, where part of me wants to withhold communion entirely so that no one in this church could eat and drink judgment upon themselves. But of course we cannot do that. And I can't rob all of us of the great blessings that come from taking communion together. Paul was concerned for the Corinthians and he was duty bound to address their behavior and their need for repentance as well as challenging their views of what communion really is. 
And with us catching a glimpse of the serious nature of the Lord's Supper, every single one of us should be asking the question, what does it mean to take communion in an unworthy manner? This question should be especially significant on a day like today when we are going to partake the Lord's Supper. Let's take a quick look at a few things. In the immediate context of this letter, Paul states multiple things that would be an unworthy manner. And he addresses communion from verses 17 to 34, although other parts of the, the letter come into play as well. There's a few things that stand out. People were treating communion as a meal. They were showing up hungry and they were gorging themselves. Paul told them to eat at home before gathering together. Because the Lord's Supper is not meant to feed them physically, but rather spiritually. This is why most churches practice a very small portioning when it comes to communion. People were also overeating, giving into gluttony and getting drunk. Paul told them to use restraint. Again, they were abusing the elements that represent the broken body and the shed blood of Christ. They were using the sacrifice of Jesus to indulge and gorge themselves. Paul said they will be judged. People were partaking the Lord's Supper before others. This negated the corporate fellowship that is meant to mark communion. There were individuals and small groups that were taking communion apart. And Paul was concerned over this lack of unity and affront to fellowship and he addressed these issues as unworthy manners. As well, there's a number of other conclusions that we can make from studying this passage in the previous chapter as Paul deals with these different reasons that the Corinthians are abusing and misusing the Lord's Supper. Communion is a corporate church practice. It's not meant to be done alone or in small groups. It falls under the authority of the church leaders and it should be implemented as part of a corporate gathering. This means that we don't just do communion at home or with small groups of friends. Communion is only to be taken by those who are in right relationship with their local church and other believers. Unity matters. This means that if you're under church discipline or you are against your church or there's a, a conflict between you and, and your church or other believers, you absolutely should not be taking the Lord's Supper. So you can't just get together with a group of others who are against the church and take communion. If you've left conflict and problems in another church, and you're here this morning, you should not take communion. If you're in an unresolved conflict with other believers, you should rectify and seek restoration as much as it depends on you before you take communion. Communion requires self-examination. And that isn't limited just to our unity with the church and other believers, but it relates to our standing before God. Firstly, we must be under the grace of God, saved by the sacrifice of Jesus, before we ever eat and drink in remembrance of His body and His blood. So if you're not a born-again believer, then you must not take communion, even if you don't understand the seriousness of it. You will eat and drink judgment upon yourself. We must ensure that our relationship with Christ is authentic and genuine. And secondly, if you are saved, then you must be right with God. Just as the unbeliever cannot participate in the Lord's Supper, the unrepentant Christian must not either. We have to consider the sins for which we have not confessed and repented. 
If you're living together without being married, having an affair, cheating on your taxes, gossiping and slandering, or, or anything else that goes against God and His Word, then you need to take the time to confess, ask for forgiveness, and change. Do this before you take communion. If you are living in unrepented sin, you will eat and drink judgment upon yourself. There's also a way to take communion in an unworthy manner if you fail to remember and proclaim the sacrifice of Christ. If you fail to consider the serious nature of the cup and bread, if you think very little of this practice or you brush it off as just something you do in church, if you take the juice and the wafer without soberly thinking about the sacrifice of your Savior, we cannot allow the Lord's Supper to become a dead, tired, or formal ritual that we practice in the church for the sake of keeping up appearances or just doing what you do in church. And you know what? You can also take communion in an unworthy manner if you fail to apply the grace that Christ has purchased for you. What I mean is if that you sit here and you feel miserable about yourself and you view yourself in a condemning way, if you fail to understand that despite your imperfections and failures, God sees you through the lens of the righteousness of Jesus, all you need to do is confess and repent. The Bible tells us that He is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins. So if taking communion turns into a time where you fail to see how precious you are in God's sight, or the fact that you are a redeemed child of God, or you view yourself in any way other than through the grace that He has given to you by His broken body, by His shed blood, then you too are taking communion in an unworthy manner. The blood of Christ was not shed for self-pity and doubt, but for salvation and victory. And so, when we take communion, we must make sure that we're not living in active, unrepented sin, but we must also make sure that we truly value and apply the amazing truth of the work that Christ has done on our behalf. And in all these issues and more, we must follow Paul's urging and examine ourselves before receiving the elements. Please do not be found among those who are sick and weak or dead because you are eating and drinking judgment upon yourself. But if you are seeking to walk in the Spirit, and you are a child of God, and you are living in repentance to God, then do not abstain from communion over fear of consequence. Remember, our God is our Redeemer. When we ask for forgiveness, He gives it freely and immediately. Immediately. When we turn away from our sin, He casts it as far as the east is from the west. There's no time of penance that must be served. There isn't a waiting period on being made right with Him. If you have something you must confess, do it today. If you have ongoing sin in your life, end it now. And move forward with a clear conscience before God. Move forward confidently because you are covered by the blood of Christ. You know, the way that Jesus instituted communion astonishes me. Every time I look at this, I'm taken back. The Lord's Supper is something that comes from the Last Supper. When Jesus ate with his disciples before he was executed. And this Last Supper takes place during the time of Passover. A feast that commemorates the freeing of Israel from Egyptian captivity. Specifically, the night of the final plague. When 
The Israelites put the blood of sheep over their doorposts and frames, and the angel of death passed over their homes, killing all the firstborns of the Egyptians and even their animals. Now, I don't want us to miss the amazing imagery here. God is sending the angel of death. You could think of this as the judgment of God upon the land. Anyone who is going to be spared must take a clean male lamb without any spot or blemish. In other words, a perfect lamb must kill it sacrificially and must place its blood over the entryway of the home. Then when this judgment comes, this angel of death, those who are covered by the blood of the spotless lamb will be saved. There's an entire feast that is regularly observed by all of Israel to remember and celebrate the faithfulness of God and the salvation and freedom of the Jewish people. Now think about some of the ways that the Bible describes Jesus. 1 Peter 1.19 says, But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Isaiah 53.7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So in the context of the Last Supper, where Jesus calls his disciples to gather together for a Passover feast, to remember the salvation and freedom of Israel, we can bring in this understanding from being on this side of history and having all of Scripture available to us, that Jesus is a perfect spotless lamb who came to earth to be willingly sacrificed so that by his blood, people could be covered and saved. He gathers his disciples to celebrate a feast that is a total foreshadow of what he is about to do, and then he tells them what he's about to do, and he instructs them regarding this feast practice and what it truly represents. This Passover feast comes to its climax and completion when our spotless lamb sacrificially dies. And as 1 John 1, 7 says, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so our Savior replaces this old sign of Passover with a new sign, communion. He gave us this physical practice wherein we could enter together in fellowship and worship and proclamation, and remembrance. He gave us physical elements to remind us that He is our spiritual food and that we receive spiritual nourishment from Him. Another amazing thing about the Passover is that they would take that lamb that they sacrificed to get its blood to cover them, and they ate the flesh. God called them to eat the flesh. And here we are today where we are saying that we are taking the broken body of our lamb and eating to remember. Where we're taking the shed blood of our spotless lamb by which we are covered and saved. How can we not stand in awe when we consider the beauty of communion? In light of all of this, How can we prepare ourselves for communion? We must carefully consider our standing before God. Are you saved? There's that song, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Come be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Is that you? We must soberly reflect upon our sin and our need for repentance? Do we have things to confess? Do we have things to repent of? We must put an end to ongoing sin. Are we living in continual, habitual, unrepented sin? We must put an end to it. We have to restore our relationships with other believers as much as it depends on us. Do we need to say sorry? Do we need to ask for forgiveness? Do we need to accept 
the apology or request for forgiveness from others. Believer, there is nothing in this world that somebody else will do to you that is worse than what we do to Christ. There is no one on this earth that will cause you greater pain than the pain that we inflict and give to our God. There's no one that will disrespect you as greatly, hate you as greatly as we have and at times do our God. And yet, He cleanses us from all unrighteousness and He is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins. We must restore our relationship and standing with our local church and our elders. We have to evaluate and correct our thoughts towards communion. Don't let it be a dead practice. Don't let this be an old, boring church ritual. And we have to meditate on the incredible sacrifice of Christ and all that he has done for us. And this last point, by the way, is the only way that we can do any of the other things I listed. We have to meditate on the incredible sacrifice of Christ and all that he has done for us. Dear people, God has given us this sacrament, this ordinance for our blessing. Our spotless lamb gave himself up for us at the time of Passover, and by his shed blood we are saved. Look to him and behold his glory as we join with one another and with Christ as we remember his broken body and his shed blood. And we proclaim his great works to each other and the world around us. Houston Baptist Church, do not eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. Christ has done everything on our behalf so that we can come before him boldly and in purity. We must follow Paul's urging and examine ourselves and then we can partake in communion with celebration and worship. Let us prepare ourselves in mind and heart as we think about our Savior and all that He has done for us. Let's pray. Lord of all creation, we come before You humbly, seeing the weight of our own sin, feeling the weight of our own sin, wanting to behold you in your glory, but perhaps we are unable right now. Lord, forgive us, this church, these people. Forgive us for our many sins against you. How we blaspheme you and we grieve you and we turn our backs on you how we turn our backs on each other and, and hate and ridicule and scorn and mock each other. Forgive us for our gossip and our slander, the sins that we keep running back to like a pig to its filthy trough. Thank you, Lord, for your great love for us for the sacrifice of Christ by which we can be saved, we can be restored, we can be redeemed and made new. Thank you, Lord, that each and every day as we fall to sin and failure, as we grieve you, as we become guilty or start to feel condemnation upon ourselves, all we must do is confess and believe. And you are faithful to forgive us. No steps, no labor, forgiveness. Lord, forgive us and let us move forward this day in purity. Work in each one of our hearts that we would confess the things that need to be confessed to you. Work in each one of us, give us the strength to put to death the deeds of the flesh, to put to death the sins that we are stuck in in our daily lives. Make us look like you, Lord. We pray, prepare our hearts and minds.
Amen. I'd like to ask the servers to come forward as we move now into this time of taking the Lord's Supper. I want to read a passage found in Matthew 27 to, to help us think about Christ and His sacrifice. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah And one of them at once ran and grabbed a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion asked those who were with him, and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Mike, can you pray for the body? Father, we thank you that you sent your Son to this earth to live with us, to teach us, and to die on the cross. That your Son, who had no sin, died to pay the price for all of us who have sin. And your Son did not have a painless death, but a very painful death, a public death, a humiliating death on the cross. So we thank you, Father, that you sent him to die for us. And we ask as we take the bread today that we would remember the sacrifice that he had made for us. Help us, Lord, to be worthy of that in some small part and to always remember. Amen.
the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we pray? Father, we think once again upon that old rugged cross. And Lord, the hymn writers had it right when they penned, what can wash away our sins? What can wash away my sin? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Lord, we recognize this morning that our entire faith hinges on what happened on that cross that perfect, perfect Lamb of God dying for each one of us. Might we be mindful, Lord, that there are many around us who have absolutely no clue of what that blood is about. Lord, that we might do as you have commanded to go about and preach your word, tell others, And, Lord, that they, too, might be able to partake in what you have done for us. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness that you have provided. May we always be thankful. Amen.
In the same way, after supper, he took this cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
Is our God. I leave you this morning with the words of Ephesians 3 17 through 19. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Go in peace. And join us downstairs.